Okay, Erev Tov. Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, and thank you, uh, Rabbi Clapper, for agreeing uh, to teach uh, some of uh, Rav Hankin's uh, Torah. Uh, Rav Hankin uh, just uh, passed away, and he was one of the leading poskim of uh, the Dati Umi, the modern Orthodox community, uh, a towering and courageous uh, Tamar Chacham. He was a Mechaber Sfarim and a Posek. Uh, he wrote uh, the Chuvat uh, of the Bnei Banim and uh, the Chiva Yetera commentary on the, uh, on the Torah and hundreds of articles and, and, and journals and periodicals. He was American, uh, born in uh, Pennsylvania, studied at uh, Yeshiva Flatbush and Columbia University. Um, and then he spent um, uh, many years uh, with his grandfather, the, uh, the famous uh, Posek uh, of Yosef Eliyahu Hankin, from which he received his uh, smicha, an incredible uh, thing to receive smicha from your own uh, grandfather. Uh, he made Aliyah in 1972 um, and uh, moved to Yerushalayim uh, after being the uh, Rav of the Beit Sha'an uh, uh, Valley area. And when in Yerushalayim, he was the uh, really authority and the post for for the for, for the Nishmat program and the entire Yoetzat HaLacha uh, program. And many of his uh, you know later responsa deal with a wide range of issues uh, in all areas of, of uh, life. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll hear from my Clapper tonight on um, matters of uh, religion. And, and Christianity, but uh, one of the areas that Rabbi Hankin wrote um, extensively on are the uh, halachic discussions around women, specifically uh, their role in synagogue and ritual life. Um, and um, he even translated many of those uh, responsa into English to make them uh, available to a wide range of, uh, of, of people. So we wish uh, his uh, wife, uh, Rabbi Chana Hankin and his entire family and uh, we uh, will continue his, uh, um, his, uh, his, his life uh, through his Torah and our study of it uh, this evening. So without further ado, Rabbi Klopper, uh, the virtual mic is yours. Thank you very much, Rabbi Chesis. Uh, we're going to share a screen tonight because um, obviously owing to the uh, last minute change, there wasn't time to prepare a, a usual source sheet. Uh, I want to endorse everything uh, Rabbi Chesta said, and um, just add uh, a couple of things, I guess. Um, I met Rav Hankin a couple of times at conferences. That's um, not, didn't have any, an opportunity to speak uh, Torah with him. Um, but I did have the opportunity to read um, pretty extensively through uh, the volumes of Nevanim. I have actually a full set plus a partial set uh, having, acqu having acquired over the years. Uh, we say that the true vote I just experience that I think too many of us have that we get to know a posig through the through their famous kulot, uh, and in the case of Hankin, you get to know him through his um, through his famous kulot uh, on women's issues. Uh, but let's say like you know, if, if like 25 years ago, if you would say like what was the one thing everyone knew about Rav Hankin, it was that he discovered this uh, Rishon, the Sefer Abatim, uh, who uh, who reported at one of the gedolim allowing women to receive an aliyah at a private meeting in his house. Um, and you know, then I read his tribute in English, which the English tribute were all about women's issues. And so you might think that he was a posik mixoe, right? That he was a posik who dealt with those specific kinds of issues. And so I was really glad when I finally uh, purchased um, Bnei Vanim. I think I purchased my original volume from him directly uh, at a conference and just discovered he didn't find that Rishon because he was looking for Makorod uh, that would support particular results. He found that Rishon because he knew all the obscure Rishonim cold before there were computers that let you know all the Rishonim cold. He just right, he just knew, or he read, you know, as, as every as every Rishon was published, he read it um, cover to cover, and he I mean, he remembered it. Um, you know, he had he had obviously an extraordinary memory, and he just you know, and you, and if you read the Trivot, um, you're constantly um, you're constantly meeting um, Rishonim that you don't ordinarily meet in halachic discourse. Um, and, and I say it's in a pre-computer era, you're meeting them just because he knew uh, all those Rishonim, he thought it was important to read all the Rishonim who didn't write Pirushim on Shas, but who just wrote, uh, wrote, wrote halachic works that have faded over the years because they're hard to find things in before again, before Barilan came along. 
The second thing you have is a person who has um, a profound interest in history and in the correctness of texts. Uh, and that's something also which is, you know, which is rare. You know, it's not academic. Um, right? He's not bound by academic canons. He lives his, his universe of discourse is the, um, is the halachic is the halachic world and not the not the university world, but he cares profoundly and works very hard to establish that the texts that he's dealing with are uh, are correct. Uh, he's extraordinarily creative. Um, you know, he just tosses off things as a given. He has great self confidence. He's extraordinarily honest also. So he he quotes Makur that don't reach the conclusion that he that he likes. Um, in um, his son, uh, his surviving son, his, his son, uh, Etam, who was sort of Etam Henkin Hashem Yikam Damo, was killed, as you know, in a terrorist attack some years ago. Uh, his son, Yagil, is a brilliant uh, military theorist and also a fine Talmud Chacham. I had the privilege of spending several days with him at a conference some years ago. Um, so in the Hesped that he published for his father tonight, he wrote a, a, about a very prominent truth that his father wrote in response to a, you know, to, a, to a major public situation and says that, by the way, the truth had changed completely in the course of writing it because he had an idea, but the Makaro had said something else. So he changed it, right? And if I can never, you get the impression that he never, um, he never cut corners at all, uh, right? He said what he thought was a halacha without any regard to what the reaction to it would be. And when he thought that the halacha should be affected by public reaction, he said that explicitly. Right, this is right. This is where they right because because public reaction is also halachic, uh, also halachic factor. Uh, as in many posts can get more known for their kulas and their chumras because people pay more attention to them. Uh, but you read his tribute, you'll see there are kulas and there are chumras, and we as a community should be meet uh, day with all of them. Okay, that's introduction. Let's take a look at this tshuva per se. Right, this is bnei vanim chelak gimel simin lamed vav. Uh, all these, uh, all four volumes are available on HebrewBooks.org. So if you uh, if you want to go download them, um, you can read them through, and they're really beautiful. Uh, right, very clear Hebrew. The logic is always clear, and the breadth of knowledge uh, in Rishonim is just astounding. Um, and you know, and again, you know, and organic, not uh, not the way you know what I know Rishonim obscure Rishonim is because I found them on uh, Barilan. Um, you can just see that he read. If you go back and see when they were published, you can see that he just plainly read every Rishon as it was published and uh, remembered it. Okay, so here we go. So this was in the aftermath of a series of church burnings in the American South, in Charleston specifically. Uh, a number of rabbis published um, published a public letter calling for Jews to contribute to the rebuilding of those churches. That became highly controversial. Um, I know that right, That uh, if you look online now, the only time you find reference, the, the major references to those letters are on anti liberal orthodox sites of uh, the actual letter, you can't actually find it. Uh, I don't know who the letter was written to. Uh, I will say that I, wrote, I asked specifically, I asked my friend Rabbi Dov Linzer and he says, nope, this letter is not written to him, although a previous letter on the theme of, um, on the theme of Christian music was written to his wife. Uh, so I don't know who this, I don't know who this letter was, um, was written to, but we'll see, uh, right? Because he writes to Bilam Shame and you'll see that he writes to Bilam Shame because he tells you that he appreciates the, rab the, the rabbi's writing too greatly, but he disagrees with him strongly, and so he didn't mention him by name. He also tells you that he's writing it um, a little bit late because he received the letter, Kibalti I, I got received a letter in the summer, but the truth is they did Rosh Chodesh Marcheshva. So it took some time to, uh, to get a response. So the, the Sha'ila is, Ha'im Lutar Litrom Livnot Mechadash, Knesiot Shenistrafu Begal HaHatzatot, Shayula Achrona Baratzot Habrit. Is it uh, right. Is it legitimate to contribute to the rebuilding of churches that were burnt in the wave of arsons that happened recently in the United States? And then he tells you, Rachel, because there are lots of circumstances where Christians have contributed to the rebuilding of synagogues and we accept that money. And if we don't, you don't reply, maybe those people right, you know, will feel that there's an obligation of reciprocity. And if you don't, if you're not reciprocal, then you, you there's a risk you'll generate anti-Semitism. Also, there'll be a desecration of God's name. Forget, maybe they'll be able to handle it, but um, without becoming enemies. But to create, to to generate that lack of reciprocity, that right, that Jews don't contribute to the rebuilding of other people's uh, religious religious um, buildings when they're burnt down, even though we expect that kind of reaction if there is anti-Semitic. Um, 
reaction, um, reaction um, anti-Semitic violence against Jewish institutions. So that consecrates, concentrates, uh, or constitutes the desecration of God's name. And it's really important to, you know, to understand that the desecration of God's name can happen um, even um, if you're just following halacha, but it creates, right? And I think that Chil Hashem is, a, is an argument that should always be given substantive significance. It's not, right? It's not just other people will think, but usually other people will think that because they have a moral point. Okay, so he says, so the person I'm writing to, so you included, right, you appended Trivot from the greats of Ashkenaz 100 years ago who thought about this, the Melamed Lahol of David Hoffman, who was, right, who was against it, one of the great postkim, right, the rector of Hildesheimer Seminary, one of the great postkim of the early 20th century, of Shol and Dorshin, Sim Lamed Hitir, Vichain Herach Lahatir, Vishut Mate Levi, right, so he has his postkim on each side, Vishuv Shalach Mashe Shivlo Kait Rav Gadol Shlita Birshalayim, and he also sent me afterwards some great rabbi, also unnamed in Yerushalayim, uh, who was lenient about this. Uh, what I don't think is Rav Nachum, Rav Nachum, Rav Nachum, Rav Nachum, although he was matir, this in the similar case uh, when there was an arson attack in Israel. Um, but Rav Nachum allowed it on the grounds that he absolutely held that Christianity was not of a Zarab in, in our time. Um, you'll see that Rav Henkin does not, and that's part of what makes his tshuva uh, so interesting is that he does not start with the premise that Christianity is not of a does. So uh, unlike Rav Rabinovich. So here's what Rav Hankin says. I have great, I, mean, I give great worth to the rabbi who sent me this question. But he thinks that the, uh, he thinks that the rabbi made an error. Because fundamentally he relied on this Shut Matei Levi. And he thinks that the Matei Levi makes a fundamental error in the Rambam. Okay, what's the fundamental error? So the Matei Levi said about this Rambam, where the Rambam writes, The Rambam says, all, Jew, all non-Jews who don't worship of Adazara, for example, the, right, the Ishmaelim, the Muslims, So the Matei so the Matei Levi said that when the Ramam excluded Muslims from the category of Avadazara, of De Avadazara, he also right, he just chose Muslims as a, an example, and he did not intend to include um, Christians. Um, and that's an impossible shot in the Rambam because the Rambam writes elsewhere in, in the Mishnah Torah explicitly that no stream. Uh, Christians are of the Avodah Zarahim and their day, holy day is Sunday. So the Matei Levi just made what is a, an impo- a completely wrong statement, and therefore he thinks that the rabbi who was lenient um, right, relied on this wrong statement. And he says, I can prove to you also, because the Ramam also writes in the parish of Mishnayas, um, to Avodah Zarah, he writes, Ha'umah ha'notzrit, ha'to'anim ta'nat ha'mashiach, ha'mashiach, the, right, the Christian nation that uh, makes the claim the Messiah has already come, the whole shiriye kitotehem in right in all their variant um, denominations and sects, kulam of kulam of David Azarahim. They're all uh, right, they're all of David Azarah. So it's impossible to think that the Rambam could have meant Muslims and also Christians. I want to just put in, I guess, a brief disclaimer here. My purpose tonight is to teach Rav Hankins chat. Rav Hankins understanding, from my own understanding, you can read my own article, what is the status, halachic status of the Trinity on the uh, tradition online uh, online blog. If you search for, I think, Rabbi Clapper Trinity, you'll get you'll get that. I want, just want to t- teach Rav Hankins, um, Rav Hankins interpretation. So now Rav Hankins does you know, the kind of thing that really only he does, and that he does um, extraordinarily well. He says, when he, Shabal Matelevi Lora'ad Varim Beperish Mishnayos. You know, the, the Ram writes this explicitly in Parish Mishnayas, the Christians are of David Azara and all their sects, but the, the, the Matei Levi, who lived, I think, in the early 20th century, maybe late 19th, right, would not have known this. Because the printed editions of the Parish Mishnayas left that line out, obviously because of fear of Christian censors, uh, right? Um, so, so, I don't, right, so, I don't, so he said, I, I understand why the Matei Levi didn't have the Parish Mishnayas because we didn't have it either until Rav Kafa translated it again from the, um, from the Arabic. But how could he have forgotten the Ramam, the Ram was saying very explicitly, of the Abu Zarahim, How could the Matei Levi have forgotten that? Okay, it says, So you can say, you know what? Guess what? If you read the 
you read uh, uh, older editions of the Mishnah Torah, it also doesn't say no stream. It says edumim. Okay, edumim is right, uh, right uh, is is a code word or knanim. So knanim, you don't really know what knanim, right? Unless you know the original text was no stream. There's no reason to assume that knanim means Christians. So that might be why the Mate Levi made this error, sorry, because he might have, because the Mate Levi might have believed that the Rambam actually did not um, did not explicitly state anywhere that Christians are Avodah Zarah. Uh, but he thinks the Mate Levi should have realized it because it's a giveaway when you say that Sunday is their holy day. Right now, Christians are not the only ones who have Sunday as their holy day. Right, and we, when we talk about the Miri a little bit later, we'll talk about that. But he thinks right. But his, his key line is, I mean, Tema Al Harav Hanal. But it's a shocking that the um, that the contemporary rabbi who wrote this question, or the great rabbi Yerushalayim who wrote the Heter, should fuse her Rambam mudiyakim shel dorinu negadenav, who has the contemporary text of Rambam, the corrected text of Rambam, the precise text of Rambam in front of him. Heach katav shonu tzrim enov de'avod azara klal. How could how could he write um, that Christians enov de'avod azara at all? So this obviously is a ideological position. You could take the position that the false texts are there because of siyata dishmaya, right? That God deliberately uh, God deliberately uh, allowed false texts of the Ramadan to circulate because that would allow Poskim to express their intuitions without being, gui- without being controlled by precedent. And then we turn out it was an error that doesn't undermine the authority uh, grounded in the religious intuition of the people who gave different expressions. We'll see later. Uh, the Rathenkin has a, has a, a theologically, I think, more radical version of the same idea, um, but he doesn't uh, tolerate it intellectually. Intellectually, where you are right now is you have to rely on the truth, and the truth is the Ramam never said this, and it is a Posek who relies on that in the Ramam, that's just false, and you can't, um, right, you can't, and you can't um, use it at all, right? So he thinks that both, that the Poskim who relied on the Matei Levi uh, are relying on a shot that maybe the Mate Levi can be excused for, but that we know now is an error, and therefore their authority goes away because they base it on a um, they base it they base it on an error. Okay, and then he goes through a similar argument where right? this is all based on a Gemara of Azara, which talks about um a dayam shall have um right and and uh, we have the text no stream uh, right that turns out that you can that you can never have um Commerce with Christians theoretically, because Rabbi, according to Rabbi Shmuel, who says three days before and three days after their holy day, you can't do commerce. But that text was also changed, as opposed to right, um, right. But uh, I suppose that um, where people changed, uh, you know, uh, changed it to Yom Avodat Kuchavim. But but again, all in all these cases, you're going to say these are all errors because of the censors, and he is not willing to, uh, he is not willing to undo anything that he believed right. Uh, he's not willing to build anything on what he believes to be a uh, a historical error. I'll give you a, here some specific contrast, uh, which I guess shows up in Shul, right? So we're still having this conversation, right? But Shesos and I, I guess, we had this conversation about the line of Shehem Mishdachavim Lehev Ovarik, right? So that line, which is obviously original to Aleinu, that right, that they pray to a to a God who does not save, was cut out by the censors, and I like quoting. Uh, Rabbi Saul Berman's line that uh, right that we owe gratitude to the censors for cutting that line out, and we should certainly not restore it. Now, that's not halacha; that's liturgy, right? That's the whole issue. And other people disagree. Rabbi Chesses, I think, disagrees with me on that one, uh, right? So that's uh, right. So I'm not going to tell you what I think. Well, you know, the halacha, but you know that there's an example of the same model. Okay. Um, so right here, um, here I don't know. Maybe you know here, maybe perhaps I have. Um, yeah, I know, I'm ambivalent on this one as well. I guess you know the way I would frame it is, you can't say that the Mate Levi is based on the Ramba, but you can say the Mate Levi had a religious intuition that Christianity was not a Vodazar. That was how he experienced it, and then, right, that t- says something to to us. And then we have to figure out how much authority that gives gives halacha. I don't again. I don't think you could just paskin like him, but it might be that you would say that therefore that Perushim and other Rishonim that allow that possibility have more authority because. That was Matei Levi's experience of Christianity. Okay, that's not Rafenkin at all. That Rafenkin says. So now we go to to the uh, to another famous Gemara, where Rabbi Yochanan says, "Nachrim she bechutz laaris love of the love of the kochavim." Right. So um, right, Rabbi Yochanan states that all non Jews outside of Eretz Yisrael are not really of the kochavim. So we could decide that that's just literally true. They're not of the kochavim. Uh, right, and so all the all the statements we learned, right, where um, Shmuel said that in the diaspora, 
um, as opposed to the position of the Mishnah, where we we where there's a machlokus whether the prohibition of commerce with idolaters is three days before and after their holidays or only three days before their holidays. Shmuel says in the diaspora, it's only the day of their holiday itself. And he is talking about Christians. So you could say that Rabbi Yochanan disagrees with Shmuel, that Shmuel said that Christians are, are, are of the Avodah Zarah, but Rabbi Yochanan says they're not, because he says that anyone in, in the diaspora, right, there's no real Avodah Zarah in the diaspora. So Rabbi Hankin says, nope, that's wrong. Right. So he says that in context, Rabbi Yochanan's statement does not mean that they are not theologically uh, belie- believers in Avodah Zarah, does not mean that they're not in practice engaging in Avodah Zarah practices. It just means that they're not as attached to the Avodah Zarah as otherwise for the specific purpose. Right. So the question in the Gemara is, uh, if you engage in commerce with them, are they then going to go thank their false gods, or are they then going to engage in practices such as bowing down to idols? Um, and if they would, so then you have some responsibility on Lifna Iver type grounds, right? That you're causing them to right to commit an act that is of a Zarah. So therefore, you're not allowed to engage in that commerce. So all so I think it spends a lot of time trying to prove that the um, that all Rabbi Yochanan meant is that you can count on them not being so religiously inspired that just because you engage in commerce with them, then you're going, right, then um, you're not, um, they're, they're going to go off and engage in, in Avodah Zarah worship. But it doesn't in any way mean that they're not of the Avodah Zarah at all. Right? And he says, so why is it that now, if that's true, then why is it that nowadays we generally don't enforce this at all and we allow commerce with all Gentiles on all days, right, in all days of the week? That's because we think that they are even less attached than they were in Rabbi Yochanan's time. And nobody goes and thanks their God just because they engaged in a commercial transaction. But he thinks they really are of the Avodah Zarah. Okay, right? Says, you know, this is a whole tension about this whole approach about whether, uh, right, whether we really wish to treat the... Um, I guess we, if I wanted to put it in political terms, the collapse of traditional religion as a vir- as a virtue, uh, right, as opposed to encouraging it. Like, oh, good, right? They're not really from, uh, right? So that's the whole question which we could talk about again. But I'm not in my own voice. I'm in Rav Hankin's voice. Um, okay, right. He said he quotes he and he quotes a Ravon that he quotes a number of history about Trivet about this. He says that when we're talking about renting houses, it just means that they are not a dukimba, they're not attached to the religion, they don't practice their religion in their homes. Right? And we, right, and we, we, we assume, therefore, we can rent them houses, we're not worried that they're going to bring Avodah into their house. Uh, but he says, uh, right, in the Eastern Orthodox locations, right, this is Ravon already knowing this, right, in Russia and Eretz Yavan, in, right, in Russia and Greece, Vade Adukin, right? So the Ravan said all those permissions only applied in Western Europe uh, or certain parts of Western Europe, but right where, the, where there was a Catholic church, but where there's an Eastern Orthodox church, um, right? Then you know that in fact they are very attached to their iconography, right? So right, as Rav Henkin says, the Kavanah told the Notrim Orthodoxim, Shehikir Kishinodad Be'eretz HaSlavio, that the Ravan, when he traveled through the Slavic lands, he saw Eastern Orthodox churches, and they are still much more iconographic than Catholic um, than than um, Catholic churches. Okay, so he writes. So Ravenkin again, you know, he's trying to be very precise historically. He knows where the Ravon was, uh, right? He knows the differences between um, between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox, and he thinks that the Ravon uh, knew them as well. And then he tells you a position which is really important. He says, right, so. The Rambam said they're all of the Avodah Zarah. All other, right, the Ravon says they're all of the, they're, they're, they're Christian, their Christians are of the Avodah Zarah. What about the Meiri? So he says, and even the Meiri concedes, that individual Christians are classified as the Avodah Zarah. Even though nationally, the Christian nations are not classified the way that Avodah Zarah nations were classified by the um were classified uh by the um by the Gemara and earlier Rishonim. So this is a really important point. Um and I'm gonna try not to um again not to interpose too much of myself. There is a famous uh book by Professor Moshe Halbertal in which he argues that the Meiri actually 
held that uh, Christianity was not of a Zara in any sense at all. Um, Rav Henkin uh, thought that was simply wrong. Um, Rav, 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 Henkin, Rav Henkin thought that um, that the Mary held the Christians were of the Avodah Zarah. Uh, and I don't, sorry, I didn't, I didn't seem to have left the right page on it. But if you, it's right, he says, he says the low kifi, the low kimi should ta'abid varav, as opposed to somebody, uh, right, somebody who objected to, uh, who, who, mistake, who mistook his words, which means Professor Halbertal. Uh, on this, I happen to agree uh, fully with, um, with um, Rabbi Henkin, um, but you should just be aware that his position is, his position at this stage is that there is um, no position among the Rishonim that believes that Christians are not of the Eved Um When he goes through all the all the Rishonim, he says, right, he thinks all the Rishonim who quote even who quote that Rabbi Yochanan that they're not a Dukim, um, right? They all believe. Sorry, they, they hold the Rabbi Yochanan that in Chus Laris says no, they're not of the Eved They only mean they're not a Dukim. There's no Rishonim left to take to take this position. Um, Okay, so now then he, he right he says, but there is, there is despite um, actually let's, let's read this paragraph just for to show you his style again. It says that the, the non Jews we live amongst us. So right, this is with medieval Western Europe. Uh, that way we have a presumption that they do not worship it. They do not worship a vodazara. Okay, that seems like a very lenient position. And the commentaries disagree about the, the intention of the Tosfos. The Marsha held that Tosfos really held that 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 I doubt that the um, the non-Jews like Rabbi Yochanan simply don't worship a Zarah. But the Maram Lublin only read it the way Rav Hengen did. And it just means that they don't engage in religious practices as a result of commercial practices. Okay, so the Alma Shapirim of the Eved Azarahin. So there's a Machlokas Achronim about what Tosus meant. And Rav Hengen says, I think the Maram Lublin is right and the, um, and the Marsha is wrong. Why? The Ein La Sot Machloket Bechinam. It does, to claim that there's a fundamental dispute between the Tosafists and the position of Rabbi Elchanan that they quote at the end of the Tosafot, that seems to, right, when Rabbi Elchanan, he says, the Shirov Dvarav Hemal Pi Riaviv, Rabbi Elchanan is the son of Rabbi Yitzchak uh, of Dampier, who is the fundamental Tosafist. And so the claim that the father and son have a fundamental wide-ranging dispute, even though they're cited one after another in the same, in the same Tosfut, that he thinks is implausible again historically. He's very, very sensitive about such things. And therefore he believes that all those Rishonim think that Christianity is of a desire. But then he says, Ibra, lav kuli almahu. He said, but I have to be honest with you after I spent all your, I knocked out the Mate Levi's Pshat and the Rambam. And I knocked out everyone's, everyone who quotes this line um, I knocked that out that claim that it means they're not really of the Eved Azara, even when they say so explicitly, they don't really mean that. But I got to tell you, there's one reason it did hold differently. Because Rabbi Nagershem Oragola quotes Rabbi Yochanan says, So the Rabbi right, so he thinks that Rabbi Nagershem is explicit that there is no Eved Azara. Uh, there is no Avodah Zarah in Chutz Laris, Mevur, Shapiresh, Rabbi Yochanan, Cholik on Shmuel, right? So he thinks that there is a dispute. Rabbi Yochanan really thinks that uh, there are there is no Avodah Zarah in Chutz Laris at all, right? Ladato Nochrim, Shabbat Chutz Laris, Enam of the Avodah Zarah Klal, right? And therefore, he says, but it really is this interesting shot. So according to that position, they're not of the Avodah Zarah, but he says nobody would argue that their actual crucifixes are not Avodah Zarah. So he thinks crucifi- the crucifixes of Avodah Zarah, just like any of any Avodah Zarah made by a non-Jew, is usher even if it hasn't yet been worshipped. But they themselves are not of, it, of the Avodah Zarah. Okay, then he tells you, right, you know, the Rabbi Gershom Baragola says that, and he can even find other Rishonim who quote that, but that makes no sense. Because the whole basis for making the crucifixes or idols that are made by non-Jews us, or is that they're going to be worshipped. But now you're telling me that the worship isn't of a Zara, so how could it possibly be this position? How, how could this position possibly be um, 
possibly correct. So he thinks that this pshat is very unlikely. But instead, he offers a he offers a new pshat, which I think is very exciting. Uh, he says, and here you get to see his uh, his creativity. You can explain Rabbi Gershom's explanation as follows. According to what the Rambam wrote, and the Rambam writes that a non-Jew who violates one of the seven mitzvot b'shogeg, accidentally, is patur. Okay, they're exempt from punishment. But the question always is, when you say they're exempt from punishment, does that mean that they did something wrong, but they're not? it doesn't rise to a punishable offense? Or does it really mean that this is the kind of prohibition which is only violated deliberately. If you do it accidentally, nothing happened at all. Uh, for example, uh, Rechana Wasserman, I believe it is, has a famous claim that the since the on, the authority of the Rabbanans is the authority of the rabbis, not anything intrinsically wrong with the actions they forbid, therefore he argues that there is no such thing as violating a Durabanan Bishogig. Right? Because you haven't, right? Because the whole, when you violate a Durabanan, you're just violating the authority of the rabbis. If you do it accidentally, you're not violating their authority at all. Right, so Rabbi Hanan therefore poskins, I believe, if I recall correctly, that right, that if you live, right, if you have the kind of religious sensibility that says that when you do something wrong, you have to atone for it in some way, you have to make up for it in some way. So that applies to biblical violations, but rabbinic violations, if you did it accidentally, then there's no need for atonement because you did nothing wrong. Unless, right, so, so he says, aha, gam enam yudim So he says that Christians have no way of knowing that their religion violates the technical uh, prohibitions of Vodazara according to Halacha, uh, particularly because, as he comments right in his Shuvah on the Meiri, which we have right, which we have not seen in detail, the Meiri writes in one place that Christians are monotheists, right? They believe in right. They just have they just make errors in terms of the nature right the nature of the single God. So therefore, they entitle they they are plausibly believe themselves to be monotheists. And therefore, he says, so therefore Christians, what Rabbi Gershom means is not that Christianity, is, Christianity isn't a Vodazara, but that Christians, the violation of a Vodazara in Trinitarian belief, um, or for that matter, maybe even in certain kinds of, of ritual practices, are accidental, and therefore the people are not of the Vodazara, even though the religion remains it, uh, remains that way. Um, and he suggests that may, maybe there's a difference between individuals and um, and public cases, but that's, that, that I think is a really a really interesting idea. And then he says, but he says that the whole idea of Rabbi Gershom is is really weird because uh, a it seems right again. How could you claim that there are things which are idolatrous even though the people engaging them are not engaging in idolatry? So we could split the difference now and say they're engaging. They will these these objects will be worshipped by people who will worship them under the mistaken belief that their worship is uh, is fully monotheistic he doesn't think that's a very uh, he doesn't think that's a very clever approach he rejects the idea that maybe there's a difference between the common people and the priests because who says that common people are less attached to their religion um, than priests are and um, right he thinks and he thinks that you know that in fact the whole claim that there is no religiosity nowadays is difficult to square sociologically okay so that brings us to a uh, very famous um, dispute. There's a famous line in Tosfa, which uh, which really brings up the question about to what extent can we canonize halachic errors. So Tosfa famously says in a discussion about, uh, which is sort of ironically, right? The discussion is about whether one is allowed to perform business partnerships shutafut with uh, with idolaters, and we discover that the word shutafut in the context of this has three meanings. Um, the meaning that does not matter to us is this idea of forming a, part, a business partnership with an idolater, even though possibly because somebody had too much of a sense of language, um, right, the word shituf shows up in the Tosfit as well. And what it says there is, Lo ashkechan grom la'acherim uh, right? We have not found that it is forbidden to cause other people, meaning non-Jews, l'shatef. Um, and the question is, what does that mean? What not lushatev? So the, the Rama possibly uh, seems to suggest that it means that um, polytheism is not forbidden for Gentiles as long as their uh, chief god is our god or something of the sort. Uh, whereas for Jews, it's about Azara. and that position uh, has become, you know, in many ways, I guess the 
the default halachic position. If you ask people what do what does halacha say about Christianity, so many people will say uh, that they take the position that Christianity is a vodazara for Jews, but not for non-Jews. Um, and maybe that's what the Ramah means. Um, so Rafenka immediately points out that there's a huge machlok at Achronim about what this about what the word mean, means, and the pshat he thinks, and here. You know, in Yehuda Ve'od, I think it doesn't need my endorsement, but I think it's, um, I can't find any sense, any any plausible way of maintaining the, the, the other position. Is it that they're utterly, that there's no prohibition at all against them, them believing, worshiping other gods as long as ours is involved? Or maybe the actual context is the actual context of the Tosis is talking about a question whether the you should be you're, you should be allowed to engage a business partnership with Christians, even though if there's a business dispute, um, you're going to have to bring the Christian to court and and make them swear an oath. And when they swear an oath, they're going to swear an oath that involves shituf, uh, right? So the question, right? So that shituf is not going to explicitly mention uh, right mention multiple gods. But is likely going to mention God and let's say right the we should say God in the Bible. So for Jews, there is a specific prohibition of Mishatev Shem Shemayim Devar Acher Bishvua of swearing by God and anything else in the same sentence. Uh, right, as Rav Hankin says, Lugma by God und Saint Ploni. <laughs> right by God, right by God and a particular particular saint. So the question is, does Tosfot mean? That when he says that non-Jews are not musharim al shituf, does he mean that they're allowed to be polytheistic as long as they have the one God as part of the pantheon, or does he or, or does uh, or does it mean that they are allowed to swear by God and by something which is not God in the same sentence, because that's a specific prohibition for Jews? Rav Hankin concludes, and I think that um, I think that's absolutely correct that it's only referring to the context of an oath and that that position. That there is no medieval position that's, uh, and there can't be a position because, as hey, Erwin points out, there's an explicit Gemara, which uh, says you can't draw distinctions, or right, anything which is prohibited for, um, right? In, in Avodah Zarah, you can't draw, you can't, you can't draw distinctions between Jews and non-Jews. So there's, um, it's really a very difficult position, but yet it's a position which many great poskim have held. So it raises that issue again about how we deal with, uh, with historical errors in halacha, particularly because. Maybe there were some manuscripts of Tosfot in which you could conceivably make this error, but now that we have this vast array of Tosfistic positions, it becomes uh, impossible to sustain. Uh, although, again, I, if you look at my article, you'll see that there's a more radical statement of Tosfot one sentence earlier, which might mean that uh, nobody thinks that Trinitarianism is a vote at all. It's only the, the only issue is the specific prohibition uh, against bowing to idols and the um, and the belief that God becomes physical in transubstantiation, in particular beliefs about the mat, right about the Eucharist, uh, and that position is roughly where Rav Hankin ends up in the Meiri as well. That it's the the dividing of God into three persons who cannot disagree is not an issue. Um, is not an issue for of a Vodazara, uh, per se. Well, I think, at least I believe Rav Hankin ends up that way in the Meiri specifically. Uh, okay. So now he brings the question which all of you should be asking, which is really the great moral question. He says, don't be bothered. How could we say that all the Christians are related to Zara, which means since all, all the seven mitzvahs are, are capital crimes, that they're right, that they're liable for capitalist punishment. But many Christians today are highly cultured, chesed, and generous people. Israel and Judeophiles, right? Philo Semitic. And we live in their protective shadow. So, how could you possibly take a position in Halacha which says that really they're liable for capital punishment? We could say, well, you know what? Maybe they held somehow like a bit of Gersha. Because maybe, maybe they're doing it accidentally, right? So, we could have with pragmatic answers. Um, um, he said, but those that's not really sati- that's not really satisfying. Okay. He says, so what we could just say is It's just like we don't understand why non-Jews are uh, right, theoretically would be violated. It's a capital crime to eat flesh from live animals. So what? So we can just say it's a chok. 
right? It's a chok, right? Afal pisha gam zayinim levan lano. All the shavu mitzvos are chukim, or at least now, right? You know, five, five of the two of the seven shavu mitzvos are just chukim. We don't understand why it is. And you might say, okay, that's really unsatisfying answer. And he says, however, we don't have to be bothered by this because biyamenu ain lano harogish. We we have no power at all. El adrosh v'kabel schar. So this is just a theoretical thing. So that might be enough for some people, right? It might be enough to say, you know what? There's a moral problem because the Me'iri is right that we find the Christians around us to be good people. And how could you possibly claim that lehalacha, you're supposed to be executing good people, right? So the answer is, well, you know what? We don't have the power to do it. And it's a chok. But that leaves you with a deep sense of moral disquietude. And Rav Hankin is not going to leave it uh, at that. So then he leaves it. Then he, so then he takes one step further. He says there's a position of the Agod Asheri, which he wants to adopt halacha, which says that there is a difference between the way in which, uh, perhaps, the way in which capital crimes exist in halacha for Jews and the ways in which capital crimes exist for halacha for non Jews. Jews can um, commit actions, and some of you can say you did a capital crime, and so you're Chayev Mita, and the court is just, perhaps you could argue, is just um, recognizing your punishment when it passes sentence. But for non-Jews, he says, there's no such thing as liability for punishment in the absence of a trial. The fact of having performed an action does nothing to change your status. Therefore, he says, it's not just that we have no uh, power to carry out capital punishment. It's that in the absence of a court system, there are no capital crimes. Right, and he's just like a Jew who right who violate who right who violated Shabbos without going to court. Uh, right, so maybe maybe Jews you can even argue are stronger, but he wants to argue that in general, um, in general, right, the whole system of the Shabbat Mitzvot at least, uh, there's no concept of anyone being Chayav Mita until they're brought to court, and therefore the whole claim, well, how can you possibly relate this in this way to people? Um, right, the answer is we don't relate that way to people. Right, we have this hypothetical system, uh, right? That that under sense, that that might be in a different system, uh, a different time would create a moral difficulty. But in our system, the fact that people are being oved avodah does not in any way change their legal status as full human beings, and we have full obligations to, because there are no liabilities for performing in one of the shav mitzvot be noach in the absence of a um, in the absence of a. Of a, of, a, of a Jewish system, right? So you can have a hypothetical belief that in the, um, right, that in, in the Messianic times, Jews will have that kind of power. But when we don't have that power, it's not like we, we are saying, oh, we can't carry out our obligations. What we're really saying is we have no such obligations. They have done nothing. And so perfectly ordinary commerce um, uh, can, uh, can take place. All human rights exist. All human obligations exist. Gratitude, all those sorts of things just disappear. So you might think, okay, that's not enough to solve the moral problem either, because you're still saying, okay, you're still saying, but in a hypothetical future world where we had power, all of a sudden they're not going to change; they're still going to be good people, and right, they're, and being good people, right, and you're, and all of a sudden you have a Jewish court, and now there's going to be a chiyav mita because now you have a court system. So he says, no, you're entitled to believe, you're entitled to believe that in the messianic era they're going to realize that they made a mistake, so the issue won't come up at all. That, right, in the Messianic era, uh, Messianic era, right, you're entitled to believe, right, when the Messianic era arises, they'll all immediately do tshuva and become real monotheists. So now, that is, you might argue that's, that's psychologically uh, implausible, you might argue that's, that, that, um, that it's not really respectful. I think that those points are, those points are both true. Um, but part of the idea of, of saying that that's the halacha and you can believe what you want about the messianic era, okay, you can also believe about the messianic era that we'll discover that our definition of the was wrong. Right, right. What he, what he, right. What he accomplishes is that in the here and now, you don't have to relate to them as of the who are criminals escaping punishment in that regard. You don't have to feel that you have a, that you have a desire to carry this out. You don't, it doesn't have to impinge on your friendships, none of that, because there is, there are no consequences at all to their current, uh, right, to their current behavior. And then he goes much further. He says, 
I will now tell you something which is a secret. Okay, not so much of a secret now that it's been published. <laughs> By the time you wrote it, it was right. It was right something I've held close to my close to my vest. The mission, right? And here you get to see his theological creativity uh, and his his courage. His courage as one. In Brachos, it says in the Mishnah. You have, to, you have to make a bracha on the bad just as you make a bracha on the good. And what, he, what that means is, he says, then you know, that most of the time, what happens to people has some good and some bad. And sometimes the same thing is both good and bad. And so then you break a bracha on both of them. And sometimes the good happens now and the bad happens later. And sometimes the bad happens now and the good happens later. But the bracha is always about the present and not about the future, right? It's not about anything which hasn't which hasn't happened yet. But you should really you should always be grateful to God for everything, the good of the present, right? So there's a whole long theological um, introduction to tell you that sometimes there are things you can't tell whether good or bad for a long time. Like says right, the selling of Yosef to Mitzrayim, right? At the time you wouldn't you wouldn't make a shechianu or a tova metiv because Yosef got sold to Mitzrayim, but in the end it turns out Right, it was all for the good. So sometimes things that seem obviously bad are really good. So now what's his example here? Right, he says, and everything that God does is for the good, meaning that even things that seem terrible are right, are terrible, um, really have to have some good in them. So therefore, it must be that there was some aspect of chesed even in the destruction of the, Beit, of the second Beit HaMikdash, even though that's the worst thing imaginable for the Jews. Okay, because, right, what's the good? Is because because if the mikdash had lasted several hundred years, and there would still be right, there would still there would still be idolaters um, right doing all these terrible things. Then the Jews would have learned from them right, and the base of mikdash would have been uh, would have been would have, would have been corrupted, and the Jewish people would have been permanently destroyed. So it's a good thing the base of mikdash was destroyed in that sense because it prevented us from hopelessly corrupting it. Um, whereas nowadays, he says, right nowadays everybody. Is everybody everybody stays away from Korbanot, and that prevents a lot of the Um So who did he say? But here's the one. He says, "Ilo haytah yom chaval adun bnei Noach al zayin mitzvot." If nowadays there were any kind of obligation to try and impose the Shev the Noach had mitzvot, even just in Israel, we would be destroyed in our attempt to do it. So therefore, he says, "We should write." Therefore, he says, "We should be grateful," and there's even a bracha about our absence of power, because the absence of power is what enables us to survive. And we would perhaps extend this to say, and also it enables us to avoid the moral difficulty um, of this entire, of this entire uh, challenge. Okay, so this all this was long introduction, uh, right? Where he, he's addressing the question of whether you can give money to rebuild churches, and he spends all this time demonstrating that really Christianity is a Vodazara, but then he comes up with one way out. But even though Christianity is a Vodazara and Christians are engaging in a Vodazara practices when they do that, A, Christians are doing it accidentally. And so they are not Ovde Vodazara who are liable for anything. B, even if they were doing it on purpose, there's no, right, there's really no liability in the absence of a, of a court system. And C, we're very grateful that we don't have a court system because we have no interest in imposing such liability. So that's his long way out of what he, the moral challenges of his explicit acknowledgement that Christians seem to be really good people and we owe gratitude to them. And therefore, if anybody were to interpret halacha differently, the only thing you could do is to say it's a chok. And saying it's a chok, which drives you to immoral actions and to lack of gratitude is a bad thing. So he finds ways in which there is no practical expression to this halacha. Okay, but what about our... Um, what about our specific halachas? Now he begins the question of building churches. So there's a Gemara which talks about build that you can build with idolaters. There, um, you can build you can you can build with them up until you get to a point called a um, called a kippah, uh, right? The archway or something like that. So he goes through a whole this machlokas Rashi. Um, um, the Gemara, the Gemara, there was a quote to Shulchan Aruch, right? Yesh mish omer asur lahalvot l'tzarech binyan beit elulim shalov deilulim. Some people say. That you can't even lend money, forget giving money, you can't lend money for the rebuilding of a Beit of Odazara, which he seems to think that a church should be at this ground. And obviously, you can't sell them things like incense pans. And the one who avoids doing that um, uh, succeeds. So, I think that's an interesting interpretation of that. The, 
you know, the the more obvious interpretation of it is these things are really usher, but we know that nowadays many people are doing them. And if you actually keep the halacha on this, you'll succeed. And those of you who nonetheless have your businesses selling, all right, sell, sell, uh, lending money to Christians to build churches or selling Christian churches decorations, you're not going to succeed. Um, Rav Henkin reads it as, and if you succeed thereby in preventing the Beit of Razarah from being built, good for you. Um, he thinks that there's no machloket about this um, in the end, right? That really there's a, the, the whole dis the disputes are, are about dual use buildings. What happens if you have a building which includes both a, um, let's say a bath, a bath, house, a bath, uh, a public bath, but the public bath is a statue of Aphrodite, the way the Gemara talks about it. So he says that it seems like the real issue is, can you build the, um, right, is uh, everybody, everybody's going to agree that you can build the building, but you can only, um, you can, but you have to stop when you get to any part of the building, which is specifically dedicated to the, uh, right, to the, um, the sustaining of the, of the idol or the worship. Okay, right, he goes through a whole series of, um, of interpretations, at the end of which is right. The end of which is he ends up thinking that um, really it should be clear that you can't give money to the undifferentiated building, uh, building of a church. Okay, you can build dual use buildings, but you can't build a church which is a, a church sanctuary. Okay, uh, right and there he says right at the end of the vikavan shastrul if not by lavadazara. Since in the end we decide you can't build houses that are intended for lavadazara, Tosfos say that you can't lend the money either. Obviously, you can't give the money. The Kuli Alma Modi Bahachi, right? Everybody agrees that you cannot give money for the rebuilding of a Beit of Azara. Zulad Ulai Harashba, maybe the Rashba doesn't, and he's not sure that Rashba really exists. He tells you that there's a position which is attributed to the Rashba, and it contradicts the Rashba elsewhere, but it turns out that the the, that the uh, position attributed to the Rashba is actually in a manuscript which is misidentifi misidentified. It's not really the Rashba. Uh, okay, again, that's Rav Henkin being very, very precise about such things. Okay, so you might think at this point, right, so Rav Henkin's gone out of his way to tell you right, all the core halachic issues. Uh, right, Rav Henkin told you that Christianity is a Vodah uh, what, Christ, what Christians engage in is a Vodah and building a house for a Vodazara is absolutely forbidden. You can't get away with it with technical claims that the house is not really, uh, is not really itself for a Vodazara. So you might think at the end of that, the result is going to be you can't contribute to the rebuilding of churches. So now we get to the, right, to uh, what Ray Wilkins, I guess, would call the money quote. Right? How do we really pass it? So the Kavanch Ustra, right? So Tosfus, right? So we just said that. The Apple Pekin, so, but despite all this halachic reasoning, in my opinion, I think there are ways to allow the contributions. Uh, right, Latir, the to right, permit giving, um, um, giving the, um, giving, right, giving, giving the, uh, right, giving, giving, giving the money for it. Why? Right? to rebuild these churches that were burnt. Reishiti says, first of all, that in many Protestant churches. In Slamim, right, there, right, there are no uh, crucifixes or other worshipable images. so Slamim, they don't bow down to images. Well, Islam, they don't bow down to the crucifix. It's true that they accept Jesus as a god. And therefore, the people worshiping there are engaging in Vodazara. Mikol Makom in in Batet Filatam. He thinks maybe all the things you can't build, you can, maybe you're allowed to build houses in which, which people will go into and worship in accordance with idolatrous beliefs, so long as the house is not built to house the idols, right? If they, right, they're worshiping an invisible divided God or multiple invisible divided gods, there's nothing about the building that is us, right? So that's 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 answer number one. So at least Protestant churches, there may be no difficult at all. Therefore, you can, right? Therefore, you can certainly contribute to the building of an iconoclastic church. Um, or right now, is what it is. Or what if you're giving to a fund, and that fund includes multiple churches, some of which are. Uh, right, are iconographic and some of which are iconoclastic. So the answer is, so now we can say halachically, 
uh, we say that as long as most churches don't have don't have it, so you can assume that your money goes that way, uh, right? He called Mashiachun close betera tolinon. Whatever we can do to make right, whatever whatever presumptions we can make to distribute the money that will make this permitted, we're going to make it. So there he tells you, right? He gives you where his rooting interest in is, right? That we make all the presumptions we can dividing the money that will make it permitted. So maybe you majority. Maybe you can write a note that people that's non-binding. I dedicate right. I dedicate this money to the building of the right of this particular church. So that's his. That's his first reason. Then he says, the shenit And his second explanation reason is, when Tosfos say you can't lend money to build to build a billion, that only means if they couldn't do it without you. Because if they couldn't do it without you, then you violate the prohibition of placing a stumbling block in front of the blind. But here it is interesting to me here that he does not address Rabbi Ranovich's point that this interpretation is historically incorrect, which I find compelling, but Rafenkin doesn't seem to, to relate to it. So he thinks that the halacha really is that there's no violation of the Iver if they could do it without you. So therefore, if the whole point of this is not the money, the point of it is to make a public statement of support, that's okay. Um, right? So therefore, that's the second reason. That's the second reason. Um, that's the second reason that that is permitted. And he says, even though even if, according to Rishonim, as he says, says you're not allowed to build it with them, but that you're not allowed to build it with them, that's because there's generally a rule that when people are doing things that you think is us, or you can't participate in it, but that's not Lifna either. That's a separate thing about your own participation. And therefore, just because you can't build it with them doesn't mean you can't give them money to build it. All right, so he has three reasons now. All right, one, right, one is that, um, that many of the churches, regardless of what you think of, their, of the beliefs, there's no actual physical activity that constitutes a Vodazara going on there. B, uh, right, you can rely on majority for that or maybe even more wild ways of apportioning the money. Secondly, it's not Lifna either if they could do it without you. And giving money is not the same thing as building with them. And there's no issue with separate issue of Matnaskinam, he says, right, with, but with giving gifts because we're doing it for a, uh, for a, public, for a public purpose. And the end, he says, and a good, another way out of it is, a good way to do it, is to give the money and dedicate it, right? So give the money to dedicate the bathrooms, um, right? Or the plumbing or the parking lot. There's no prohibition against giving money to build a parking lot. If the parking lot happens to be for a bit of a desire, that's not your issue, uh, right? Because that, the, right? Because those certainly are not for the purposes of any idol, even if there were an idol. Uh, right, that is only for the purposes of the people, and a building which is for the purposes of the people is no prohibition at all. So then somebody raises the question, which he rejects in the footnote, saying, "What well, maybe buildings are never for idolatrous purposes. The, the idol is perfectly fine without the building. It's just so that people can pray there without getting rained on. So maybe all buildings are for the purposes of people. That he thinks is against the Gemara. Okay, so here's our outcome. Um, and again, I want to say clearly, this is not my psak, but we're trying to do this in uh, in memory of Adam Gadol and to give you a sense of his um, of the way he thought, and hopefully, you know, a sense of Chaval al Devde and right of the of the enormous loss that Claudius Yisrael has suffered. He right. The shaila is: Are you allowed to contribute the money? The answer is yes. Um, and that I think he shows clearly as he believes is the right answer, the necessary answer, and the moral answer. Um, but in order to get there, he's not willing to cut corners. He's not willing to take a position he doesn't believe about the status of Christianity. He's not willing to cut corners and take a position about the status of Christians. He's not willing to cut corners and, and, and take a position about the status of um, the status of churches. Um, but he gets, but he recognizes the moral difficulties. He offers you a whole series of ways of right, which enable you to believe that your intuition that the Christians around you are good people to whom you owe gratitude and proper treatment are correct. And that you don't have to feel any tension halakhically about that because Allah wants you to behave towards them in that way. It does, right? Allah doesn't want you to feel frustrated that you don't have power over them. Uh, he gives you a theological framework that right, we can be grateful that Allah doesn't put us in, a, that God hasn't put us in a position where we would be, all right, where we would have a khiyav to, or even the hint of a khiyav to, carry out obligations that we find morally uh, morally problematic. Um, and in the end, he has a technical way to allow it. All right, thank you very much for listening. And now um, this would be a good time if people had questions uh, to ask them.
Rob, I thank you. The, um, at the beginning, you made a statement that he would go where the sources took him. Uh -huh. And in this example, it seemed like the sources took him that it is a vote of Zara, but he really wanted to allow you to make a donation and he went there anyway. So that's a really good, right? That's a really good question, William for him. Uh, right, uh, that um, I don't think that he in any way interpreted a source in any way other than what he thought was the absolute correct meaning of that source. Uh, but I think the interesting you know, framing this asked about is you know, to what extent does right, to what right to what extent is halacha produced directly by sources, or to what extent does halacha often have discretionary categories that allow you right that allow you to um, to reach the result that seems proper, um, regardless. So that I think is a great question. Um, I think that had he not had those discretionary categories. He would not have Paskin this way. He would have said it was a hook and we can't do anything without it. That's my take. Uh, I don't see it, you know, I don't I don't see any I'm, I'm sorry, any what, challenge what? to his integrity in the result because I think the way he said it was look, there's the there's the substantive issues and then there's the um, technical issues which enable him to get there. So yeah, I, I understand the challenge. Um, but I don't think that. I don't think there are any stretches. I guess that's my take. I think you could take every step step of his argument. I don't think there's any point at which he says anything, which is even a forced reading of a source or a forced extension of a halachic category. I think it's a plausibly convincing case in which the um, halacha turns out the way that it probably should. Okay, so it, he's he's well yeah. known for for for, for poskening on women's issues. Yeah. And, and, and what you, we might call a lenient way. I don't know if I, I want to use that word, but that's what I think what people call it. Um, and again, does, does he follow the same kind of mechanism here? They he reviews all the sources, but pretty much says, with, you know, that women, you know, you know, women aren't foolish like they were back then or something. You know, that you could you could argue. What, what's so, the, yeah. so I want to be very careful because he didn't say right because we have to be very careful. He didn't say here. He rejected the ways out, saying that Christians aren't the way they were previously. Right. That's the, right. Paradigm shifts, right? What he said was, if you follow the halacha in this way, you get to certain results, not others. So let's say women's issues is a good example because it's unfortunate that people quote often his leniencies, but he actually has any number of stringencies. Right? People like quoting his prohibition against uh, certain kinds of, of uh, clear mechitzot. Um, you know, he got, right, you know and, um, his right, he, I think you know he got he got he lost a certain amount of popularity. Because of his opposition to partnership minyanim, uh, although there he said that was an interesting example again, where he said that it's mutter but a bad idea, and so you shouldn't do it, even though he was the one. Right, even though he came with a really good argument to allow it, he thought in the end it wasn't halacha. And you know, in terms of women's hair covering, is an interesting middle position where he thinks that women have an obligation to braid their hairs, uh, to bra to braid all their hair, but to um, but you can cover you can you can cover only the only your head and leave the braid leave the braid exposed, so that's a lenient position for some and a strict position for others. Um, I think you know that that you know, really I, maybe I'm projecting. He he often you know what he often was was the posig who wasn't perceived as left wing, who said some things that were more lenient than people on the right wing said. Uh, right, I think that right, I think that's very different than saying he's a posig because there are lots of things that people. That people would love to permit that he absolutely prohibited, and I think there's some people who would read his trivot about women's issues and be very disturbed because they discover that, it, for example, on Nida, right, one of the interesting things is that you know that he's one of the major post of the Yotzot, and the Yotzot are not lenient on Nida, uh, right, relative to Wayu. The Yotzot, I think, uh, Rabbi Chesses can say, and Sarah can say more about this, but on the whole, if you were looking for leniencies per se, you would be better off going to Wayu than to the Yotzot on the right on the abstract issues. It might be that in practice. That the uh, that that going through that going through women gives you different results. Uh, so I don't think Rafenkin was. I think what he was is idiosyncratic, willing to be idiosyncratic, and uh, that sometimes led him to uh, right to positions that were more lenient than uh, right, than right wing postkim took. But I don't think he's consistently lenient on women's issues. Uh, I think he does have one position, you know, which is clear all the way through, which is that uh, women should learn Torah and have the authority to teach Torah. Um, yeah, which, he, which I don't think he even bothers defending halachically. He does have, and I'll take this occasion, right? I don't know if you've heard this from me before, but I think this is a great way to end. Um, he also has beautiful uh, readings of Chumash, 
Um, they're just sort of tidbits scattered already as one, one collection called Chibi Yasera. Um, there's a marvelous collection of essays, which I quote all the time, called Equality Lost. Um, in English, as part of the problem is in English, only his stuff on women's issues comes out because that's all the English speaking audience is interested in. His Hebrew stuff is much more varied, but his in Equality Lost is a title essay. He has this, I think, absolutely brilliant, um, utterly, you know, utterly transformative idea that um, what, what causes the sin in the Garden of Eden is that God talks to Adam and not to Chava. That's why Chava is vulnerable to the to the snake saying that um, right that God never said uh, God God uh, God said not to touch the tree because Adam was the one who said don't touch the tree. And so Hengen says the reason that God spoke to Adam and not to Chava is because the most important thing you can do is share Torah and to recognize right and and to see that religion is not supposed to be a source of power. So if God speaks to you, your instinct should be, which is what Abraham, why Abraham ends up being the founder of the Jewish nation, that your instinct should be to share it with everybody. Torah is not a source of power or exclusivity. Torah is a source of wisdom that you want to share with everybody. And the, and the whole cause of every sin in history is that Adam doesn't want to teach Chava Torah. He just wants to tell her what to do. All right, that's his essay, Equality, equality Lost. So the, that, that's a strong ideological position. But I don't think it's a halachic position. I think that's an ideological position. Uh, I you know I find that obviously I find it enormously congenial and powerful. Um, you know I think you know uh, I wrote a, a Torah some years ago like you know what should be the ten the ten vorts I said memes but apparently there's a misuse or an old use right the ten vorts that every modern Orthodox kid should learn before they graduate before they graduate high school and have pounded into them this is obviously you know in your top three right that uh, right that all sin all all sin is caused by men who seek to deny women equality in Torah. All right, sorry, that was a long answer, Roger. You, you get to have a comment to that one if you want. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rabbi Clapper, for this uh, teaching tonight, really an appropriate way uh, to give us a chus to uh, his memory. I'll just uh, note uh, the uh, irony of uh, the topic on uh, tonight's uh, Gregorian calendar uh, of Nittelnacht. Uh, that was, you know, it's not accidental. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to teach Torah about Christianity. I did all that. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, for joining. Have a uh, wonderful evening and a good Arab Shabbos. All right, thank you. Good Shabbos, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.